All right, welcome back to Weekend Express. It's that time where we have our interview and joining us in studio today is one Elizabeth Kanyede. Thank you very much for joining You're us welcome. in studio this morning. You're she welcome. is the first black female mayor of Bucking and Dagenham in the UK. That's quite a big accomplishment. <laughs> Thank you. So let's talk a bit about you. You uh -huh. were born and raised in Kenya. Yes, I was. How was your childhood? Paint us a picture. Well, I was born in the mid-60s in uh, Idunguri, uh, Kiambu County, uh, among a family of seven, quite a big family. I was right in the middle. Mm -hmm. I'm, the, I'm the fourth and, you know, I've got, I had two brothers and uh, four sisters. Unfortunately, my, one of my brothers, that, the reason why I'm here, passed away over Christmas season, mm -hmm. the last born brother. And uh, I grew up in a big family, learning how to share, you know, learning all, all, the, all the nice things that people do. Uh, I wasn't brought up in such posh environments. Mm -hmm. I grew up, I went to school, no shoes, and you know, so I know what it is to live in real poverty in Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to Kamboi Primary School, which is in Gidunguri in Kiambu, mm -hmm. uh, and finished then went to St. Anne's, which is within the same locality, St. Anne's Liuki, mm -hmm. where I did my O levels in the 80s. Right. Yeah. Now, at some point, you had to move to London as a refugee because of some political tension. Tell us about that. Well, really, it's not really due to some political tensions because, obviously, I was, uh, after I finished, uh, well, let me go back to that. When I finished, uh, I decided to venture into teaching. I loved teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I went to teaching, I decided to do a very, very strange thing that people wonder why I ever decided to do that. I, I told my parents I wanted to go to Trukana and teach there. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I'd been in the scouts movements and I'd learned a lot of adventures and, you know, I loved adventure. So I taught in Trukana for one year as an untrained teacher. And then I, uh, my parents decided it's too much for me because, you know, that they were not happy with what was happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, th I believe that was my first step of being very hard and, you know, living in an environment. Then uh, after that, I came back and trained as a teacher. Uh, a few years, then uh, within a very short time, I, I rose to the rank of a head teacher, mm -hmm. uh, which I thank God for because I started, uh, I became a t head teacher at the age of 24, which wow. was very unusual those mm -hmm. years in the 90s. Um, and uh, through the scouts movements, I also went to, to Canada. I lived there for one year. I've done so much within a very short span of uh -huh. time. Um, and I traveled a lot to UK and other places with the Girl Guides and the Kenya Scouts Associations, mm -hmm. which I really loved to, to, you know, to participate in. Mm -hmm. So moving to UK was a, a, an idea that I had, you know, I wanted to go to look for greener pastures. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really like they, they, you know, they usually think everybody going abroad is, you know. Going as a refugee. Uh, exactly, exactly. Africa. So I wanted to venture, you know something different. Okay. Yeah. Now you got to the UK, of course, with um, a large background and experience in teaching. Yes, and I then know. how was the transition into, of course, proving your qualifications uh -huh. in that system? Uh -huh. I mean, that was the most difficult thing for me. And I always tell people to go into a foreign country and settle. First, well, the times I'd been traveling was just for fun as mm -hmm. a scout and I had all these hosts and I, you know, I was very comfortable. But this time, moving out on my own, settling trying to get a teaching job how old I were you found by then? It. that was in my early 30s mm -hmm. and uh, it was the most difficult thing that i'll ever talk about mm -hmm. uh, because now i'm on my own and trying to go to teaching one they thought oh our accent you know always put them off mm -hmm. and i really wondered because currently anytime my people are being recruited they say that kenyans have the best accent mm -hmm. yeah, they, we manage True. But um, it happened in schools. You go and find the teachers and some of the children. And to make it worse, most of the children who thought we had an accent were the black children who had been bo you know, born there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, they always, obviously, even today, some of them still make fun of their parents and they think they've got an accent. So it was quite a difficult thing for me to venture and to start teaching and to settle. They had the culture shock, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it was totally different, like I said, from when I'd gone on, on visits. Because this time now I need my money, I need to pay my bills, I need my own housing, I need, you know, everything. And back home, obviously, people think, oh, she's gone, she's traveled, there are demands of we need this. And uh, I'd left my son for one year, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously I wanted him to be in a good school. So I, I think that was the most difficult time for me, and I was, I, I was even wondering why I'd moved away. Right. Well, but obviously there's always a beginning and uh, later I settled and uh, I'm quite happy now. Right. Well, what were some, if you can remember, some of the examples of culture shock that you went through and how did you adapt to those? Well, the winter, 
uh -huh. was never prepared for the cold. You know, I used to think, oh, that's okay, I can manage. But wait, hang on, I wake up one morning, I have to go to work, I'm not driving. And uh, however much I tried to dress up, it wasn't enough for mm -hmm. me because I'm, I'm numb and I have to go, you know. I, 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 some of the, 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 the culture shocks were like, you know, the, the weather. There was also a language barrier. Sometimes you think, uh, because the language there, it's not the Queen's English, like what we'd learned here. Mm -hmm. In fact, I tell people, we've got the best English. The area where I settled, they've got what we call the Cockney, which is not proper English. Mm -hmm. They're talking to you and they're saying things and you're thinking, oh, pardon me, what I, I'm saying? not sure what you're saying, <laughs> you know? So, and, uh, you know, a few, a, few, a few issues here, like, you know, like I said, getting jobs, you know, managing to travel from one point A to B, you know, wasn't that easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also experienced racism. Mm -hmm. I did, you know, I thought, you know, you get into a bus and, you know, trying to ask, you know, maybe you're stopping somewhere, which is the next bus stop, and they're looking at you and, you know, calling you all sorts of names. Mm -hmm. I've been called the F word, which is very common in UK. And by then, if anybody told you, don't be silly, which I do say now, you find it. When I was growing Offensive. up, if anybody told me I'm silly, I would think, you know, really, that's an insult. Uh -huh. You know, I would take you even to, to court for that. So if someone told you now, you know, what are you doing? Don't be silly. Even your close friend, you think, oh my God, you know? So th there are small, small things that really are different from what I was used to. Mm -hmm. But the most, the, the worst was the racism that was really evident openly, you know, because the times I went there, uh, it was there. I mean, these people never accepted the black people really. Mm -hmm. There are some regions, some areas where the black people are not accepted. Well, there are still bits here and there, just a few holes here and there. But uh, at the moment, you know, I think th they've learned to live with us. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you got your first job in teaching. You settled down. I did. Um, and then through teaching, you somehow managed to venture into politics through that. Tell us about that transition. Um, I must say, like, uh, I've written a few um, magazines about my, my life there. Mm -hmm. uh, leadership and politics I, I didn't start in UK. When I was still in Kenya as a head teacher, I worked uh, for a few years with the Electoral Commission of Kenya, and I was a returning officer, a presiding officer, so I had a bit of, I knew, and I could see the campaign sessions, you know. Um, one of my mentors, I would say then in politics, was my first member of parliament in, in Gizunguri, the late Adam Magugu, mm -hmm. who was a close friend to my dad. And I could see, and I really used to admire some of the ways that, you know, they're, they're doing things. And I also believe, from an early age, I think I, I wanted to be a leader. And uh, I, I, in, even in school, I used to be a prefect. Uh, I used to be a, a captain in high school. And amongst my family, I used to be the only person who could go if they wanted anything from my dad. I used to be bold enough, you know, the way African children grow up. And uh, so when I, when I moved to the UK, through the teaching and through the Scouts Association, mm -hmm. because when I moved over there, I also became a Scout leader. I used to meet with so many families. And uh, I, used, I started helping some of the black people. They thought for some reason that I knew more than they knew some of them who are settling. And I became a link. I used to be kind of advised. They, they started asking me questions on how to set or what, you know, how can we can do a few things that they weren't sure of. And thereby, I think I developed the confidence and I thought, oh, I can be a voice. So I also met my member of parliament through the same interactions with the community who actually also felt, thought, you know, you know she, she one time told me, Elizabeth, what you're doing? Why have you ever thought about being a voice to these people? You've been representing the people, you've been bringing their cases to me. Why don't you think of it? And thereby I thought, hang on, I can give it a go. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to lose. Mm -hmm. So, went on. Right, so that was, I remember, in 2010 is yes. when you became the first Briton of Kenyan origin to be elected a councillor. Yes, I was, yeah. Okay, so that was the beginning of your political journey uh -huh. in the UK. It was. All right, so tell us about that transition from 2010 to 2014 when you were elected as the mayor. Well, first, I wouldn't say that that started in 2010. 2010 is when we had the, the general elections. Two years prior to that, that's when we started the campaigning. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, it wasn't that easy also. Mm -hmm. When I put my name forward, first of all, I had a lot of objection from uh, my friends. Some of the black people thinking this is impossible. What, what the heck, what do you think you are doing? Do you think, you know, all sorts of insults. I used to get so many, you know, messages on my website and on the social media, all sorts of, you know, excuses. 
you, you are not ready for this, you know, why, you know. And even my family did not believe because one thing, my family was very, very protective of me and they thought they don't want me to, to you know, to be bullied and all that. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I don't know where I got the confidence from and I thought, I think the more the protest, the more, you know, I think the more I felt I want to venture. One, the best thing about uh, politics out in the UK is I don't need any, to spend any money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I only need to, to go out there, sell myself, sell the policies of my party. And the party is always there for me. Mm -hmm. So that is one big advantage. So when I decided finally I want to venture into politics, they usually take you on a course. You do not just go out into the field and start politicking. You go on a course, on a training, where first of all you learn the manifesto of your party. So that when you go out into the field talking to the people, you are really sure of what you're standing for. They also help you in uh, talking to people. They, help, they, you know, they give you ideas of what you need to say, how you need to approach the people. So I got a lot of confidence. So mm -hmm. by the time I ventured there, you know, I felt like I'm already there. Right. Yeah. Right now, uh, during the campaigns, of course, being of Kenyan origin uh -huh. and being in a p uh, position of leadership, you have to gain public trust. Yes. So how were you able to convince these people that I'm from a different country, but I want to lead you and this is what I will do for you? Well, in, in, the, in the 90s, we'd already had a few black people settling in the UK and especially the part of the world where I was, you know, I was campaigning but not Kenyans. I only had a few Kenyans, not more than 10 Kenyans in my particular ward. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I really wanted also my people to feel represented. And, you know, like I said, it was madness. I do not know how I really managed, you know, but I, I also had the backup and the support of uh, the white group mm -hmm. that I used to go out with because they also believed in me. And some of, I also got uh, the, the local parents whom the, the children I taught, I belonged to the local church group. So honestly, I, I had so much support. And the Kenyan community from far and wide, not just from the local place where I belonged, they came out in large numbers supporting me, talking to the people. And I also believe the grace of God, mm -hmm. to be honest. Uh, there was nothing so special about me. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, we, had, we prayed so much about it. And obviously, having come from Kenya, we are prayerful people. We are people of faith. People prayed for me, people came out to support me. So I wouldn't say that there was something special, so special about me. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about more challenges, you know, in your political career, not just being Kenyan, uh -huh. but being a woman in general, being in the political scene anywhere uh -huh. in the world as a woman. How it was is. that for you? Can I say, first of all, there is an advantage in the UK. Mm. They give, and I know in Kenya it's happening today, there's a certain percentage. They always insist that a third must be a woman. Mm -hmm. And now, because of the immigration, they put another clause where, if possible, an immigrant. So that gave me an advantage. So I had the point of being a woman, being an immigrant, you know, and so, so I think that one pushed me a bit further. Although that did not, you know, that did not determine that my, my winning. So when I went out there, I really, especially the women, felt they've got a representative. The immigrants felt that there's somebody standing out there for them. So I had, had an advantage. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're speaking to Elizabeth Kangede. She is the first black female mayor of Bucking oh, thank you. Thank and you so Dagenham in the UK. She's talking to us about her experience in politics. Of course, we're trying to find out how a born and bred Kenyan ended up in politics in the UK. Uh, she started, tells us she started her, you know, her journey not in the UK, but in Kenya, in the few things she was doing, um, traveling with the scouts, gaining leadership experience by um, interacting with different people. So as you entered um, politics, what has your biggest achievement been so far? First of all, I would say motivating and encouraging other people to mm -hmm. join in, especially women, not necessarily Kenyans. Mm -hmm. I've had so many because I do motivational talks and women empowerment programs and youth. I think I must pride of that, that uh, as having gone that far, mm -hmm. uh, I've been invited in so many places and I'm mentoring so many people. Uh, I find that, incidentally, people from the West, West Africa, um, uh, Nigerians and the Caribbeans, are the ones who really want more of that mentoring. So I have have so many of them in my programs and I feel that is an achievement because if I can leave a legacy, if I can give back, 
And that is one of the, the challenges that I have for my Kenyan community because I would like to, even in Kenya, I would like to give back something if given an opportunity. I would like to mentor people. I would like to encourage them. I would like to share whatever little I have if, if it can help anybody. Mm -hmm. So I feel, uh, and at the moment, as mayor, as I come to the end of my term, I've managed to bring a legacy of having a young mayor because I, I really have a passion for young people, to see the young people go into leadership. And the reason why I have that and I feel it's, it's an achievement, when I was growing up, I, I, I always had that uh, you are the leaders of tomorrow. I hit 30s, 40s, and I'm still being told you are the leaders of tomorrow, and I kept wondering, where is this tomorrow? And even today, I'm challenging our people that sometimes when we go into leadership, there should come that time when you, you, know, you should really hand over the mantle so that we don't start leading when we are in our 60s and 70s. How much do we have to give? Let's lead when we still have the energy, when we st our minds are still ready to serve. Mm -hmm. So I feel that I've left that legacy that uh, I've, I've inspired people, and I know because they come to me and I'm still running the, the leadership programs. Right. Now let's talk a bit about your life. You mentioned that when you moved to the UK, you left your son behind. Uh -huh. So you know, how, what's, what's your family <laughs> life like? One, well, I, I'm, I'm a single parent. My son is 22 now. Mm -hmm. uh, I left him behind for one year, but obviously my parents were looking after him. My late mom, who passed away three years ago, may she rest in peace. And uh, my sisters were really good looking at us. But, but I always felt I needed him by my side because we'd always, the years, that the six years, we'd always been together. So uh, I decided to come and get him. He was, he was six years old at the he time. He was six you years left. old, yeah. Okay. Poor boy. Mom who didn't have mom. <laughs> so I had to come and get him to <laughs> uh -huh. live with me, yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. is he following in your footsteps or? Incidentally, he says he's not a politician. Oh, okay. Actually, so he's, he's not. He's, he's into journalism. His own cause. He's pursuing a uh, TV production. He might be coming back this way. He loves Kenya. He mm -hmm. loves coming to work in Kenya. So anytime we go somewhere, obviously, he had to be part of me in my, especially in my Maori year. Uh, but he tells me openly, he's not the politician, mom is. Mm -hmm. uh, he's just a laid back person. He loves his, his, you know, his quiet life in the background. Unlike me, who is always out there. Right. Now, what would your advice be to women who are looking to join uh, politics like you did? I would say, if you feel you've got what it, it takes, just go for it. Just be determined. Follow your instinct, mm -hmm. you know, and also look for a good mentor somewhere. Don't be, because I believe uh, in the African culture, and as I grew up, maybe things are changing now, we've always had the woman as the person to, to listen and not to talk. I'm not trying to, to, to encourage women to be on top of the men and not to listen. When it comes to uh, house matters, one needs to respect the husband and you know the family circle. But in leadership, I believe we can deliver equally mm -hmm. or even better. So if any woman out there feels they would like to take leadership roles, I don't see anything that should deter them. Mm -hmm. Just have that determination, yourself believe, you know, and go for it. Okay. Now you're coming to the end of your tenure as mayor yes, in the I UK. Am. Actually, it ended last year, but you're still yes, still yes, sitting. Yes, but I'm still doing a few things here because, you know, uh, it's not until June when the new mayor comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the future for you in politics? Well, I'm still, I'm still there in the UK, but uh, I, I feel uh, I wouldn't like to, to retire in the UK. Mm -hmm. I, I believe, like the Africans say, I went there to learn and then I would like to come and give back. I'm not too sure what I would like to do, but uh, I definitely would like to come and give back something, in, you know, back to my country. Right. Uh, is there any possibility of you venturing into Kenyan politics? Time will tell. Time, Time will, will tell. tell. Time will tell. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a bit more about, you know, uh, it's quite interesting, you know, you being a Kenyan in UK politics, have you met several um, other people from African countries who are also in politics in the UK? Incidentally, like I said, the West Africans are very, very adventurous. Mm -hmm. We even have members of parliament from West Africa. Uh, I think Kenyans, we, we, we haven't <coughs> ventured so much. But I also feel like after the Obama saga, I think everybody wants to be. Mm -hmm. Now we have so many Kenyans. Yes, it. And uh, I, I left out after my term. I think I also inspired a few people to, t to go into politics. I went to Sweden and uh, there, there's one councillor in Sweden who is my good friend. I actually even went out there for a month and helped him campaign. 
and he was elected as a councillor. Mm -hmm. We also have another lady uh, in some parts in the UK. I haven't met her, but she called me and uh, we spoke and she's vying. There was another gentleman in, in, in UK who was also a councillor and had assisted him. Um, so I, I believe there's still so much that we, we can do. <coughs> Okay. Now, you're also an active member of the Kenyan community yes, in am. the UK. Uh -huh. How is it doing so far, especially uh, we're going to the run-up to the general election uh -huh. in 2017, and um, the IEBC says that uh, any country, any foreign country that has more than 3,000 Kenyans will be considered as a polling mm -hmm. station. Are there any plans for Kenyans in the UK to vote in the next election? We are, uh, at the moment... The talk is we are to vote, all mm -hmm. the diasporians. And personally, I'm going out encouraging people to register as voters. We still haven't given up, and we are hoping that the IEBC will keep their word for that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the new constitution gave us, we, we have the dual citizenship. And they also agreed that we, the, the diasporians are, are supposed to vote. Uh, I know there have been a few hitches here and there, and especially about the, the, the venues, you know, and all that, a few technicalities. But I believe at least there should be a start, even naive, the diasporians are voting just for the presidency. Mm -hmm. Because having been in politics, I know it can be a bit uh, difficult voting for the six, you know, the six uh, votes that people have to go for. Mm -hmm. But at least for the presidency or even the governor, you know, maybe uh, 2017, the diasporians should be considered for that. I've personally met the chairman of the IBC. Uh, we've had several meetings. I mean, some of the meetings where we really people have been encouraged to register. So fingers crossed because time is running out and we do not know whether they will still do it. Or well, even if they do it at the embassy offices, I mean, that is a move. And I believe uh, the diasporians <coughs> need to be considered. Mm -hmm. There's so much they, that they contribute back to the country. And uh, if, I, I believe that that should be considered. And we are hopeful that they'll keep their promise. All right. We're speaking to Elizabeth Kanyade, the black female, first black female mayor of Bucking, Bucking and Dagenham in the UK, telling us just how she made it into UK politics, having been born and bred in Kenya. You can call in and ask her questions on the, with, through the numbers on your screen as we continue with this debate. Now, Elizabeth, I understand that you're quite passionate in helping women, uh, black women and women from ethnic minorities adjust to the British society you know much like yourself when you experience that culture shock so mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you're doing to achieve this well first of all in my borough which is like a constituency um, I'm, I'm helping with uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, domestic violence and uh, the black women the way the black women are they, they believe that uh, just getting a slap or maybe a few slaps here and there is the norm mm -hmm. so we do try to encourage them not to keep up with that and they need really to come out and talk to somebody i'm a member of that group that uh, is advocating against uh, domestic violence mm -hmm. i also assist the women because um like i said the, the, the african culture has been like you know the woman is just to be in, in a housewife Mm -hmm. And I, I, I believe that the, the time has come for them also to go back to schools. So that is one thing that I advocate for. Mm -hmm. uh, when they, after they've brought up their children, uh, or even as they bring up their children, they should be thinking about their future and being also mm -hmm. uh, a participant in, the, in the contributing to the family income by going back to schools. So I do advocate for that, that women should also be considered. And thereby, if the women come to ask to be considered for certain posts or for certain jobs, once they have the qualifications, then they can be considered equally. So those are some of the advocacies that I go for, not mm -hmm. just leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I believe that women should be thinking about their own empowerment, their own future, their own income, you know, mm -hmm. generally being a whole person also. Right. Now, you know, recently in the media this week, actually, we saw a story that shocked the whole country, you know, a woman who had been part of domestic violence, mm -hmm. a victim, and she had a knife through her face. Her husband stabbed her through the That's jaw. Terrible. And it took um, doctors, you know, a, a team of five doctors from the Kenyatta National Hospital to, to dislodge the knife from mm -hmm. her face. Yeah. Do you have any such projects um, going on in Kenya, in the country, helping women? In Kenya, mm -hmm. I'm not very sure about the Kenyan, uh, but I've, I've been I've been approached by a few people. I think I'll be talking about that next week. But uh, really, this in this day and age, such things should not be happening. Really, mm -hmm. that is a murderer. That is not a husband. That is not a human being. Mm -hmm. Honestly, 
we know so, of a few slaps here and there, but there should be some women going out. I believe that they should be going out talking about against this because that was murder. Mm -hmm. I watched that and I was really, I was in tears when I saw that it lady last night. It incident, was shocking, was shocking. What I believe that be should not be happening. the penalty for this in the UK? Maximum. Yeah. Maximum. Because that is murder. Mm -hmm. That is murder. So do you feel like maybe, you know, with that um, happening, that uh, Kenya is not quite where it should be with regard to preventing domestic violence and educating women enough to avoid such, such incidents? I wouldn't say we are not because, uh, let me put my hands up and say I haven't studied enough of what is happening mm -hmm. in Kenya because I know there's a lot that has happened in Kenya of, of late. Mm -hmm. The last few years there's so much happening and all these advocacies are happening. But I believe more needs to be done women need to be educated you know that should not be happening because i believe uh, like i say that is not a husband that is not murder that's a criminal it's th so that one should not even there should be no debate about that because uh, I, that lady is lucky to be living today mm -hmm. you know absolutely so i believe i'm not too sure but by next week we will i'll find out whether there are there are groups of women or there are you know, I do not know who stands out for that, but I believe there is a feeder and all that. I used to hear of such, such groups, but there should be groups where women are educated about preventive measures or mm -hmm. what they need to speak up to somebody. There should be groups where if, if, you, if you sense that there is, a, you know, a violence, you should, you know, there should be, the, you know, definitely that should not be happening. It, Gives me goosebumps yeah, because by the time it gets to such an accent, that there, there must, must have been flags, you know, over. Past the, okay, and absolutely. this is what we talk about in UK. Women are advised, you know, if it, it might not just even be the physical, the, even the verbal abuse. They believe there is the verbal abuse, there is the sexual abuse, there is all sorts of abuse. It could be even not being given funds. That's abuse. So. If, if the woman senses such things happening, there should be where that lady can go and discuss with somebody so that there will be preventive measures Absolutely. and they get the right advice. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but there should be some. If there isn't, then it's a high time that in Kenya we believe uh, we, we should be thinking of that. Right. All right. So I believe we have uh, calls coming in for Elizabeth. Maybe we can take some of these calls now. Okay, I understand. We'll be taking the calls a bit later on. So let's speak about your one year as mayor in, uh, in the UK. What was, we've talked about your, your biggest achievement, your greatest achievement. What was the hardest challenge that you went through in that one year? Well, my challenges have been many. Mm -hmm. First of all is the timing because as a mayor, you are the first um, uh, citizen. And you are expected to go to so many places. I had no time for myself. I had no family time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I attended events which went on up to past midnight. Mm -hmm. uh, I was expected any time to have a speech ready and depends on what kind of a group. I was expected if there was any civic uh, ceremonies, I'm there as a representative, both national, international, I've, pra I've traveled out of the country as a representative of the borough. But I can also talk of good things because I've met big, high and mighty people I'd never have dreamt about. Mm -hmm. I met the Queen. I was with the Queen. I keep that as my profile picture on my Facebook page uh -huh. as a representative. I met most of the <coughs> royals. I met the Prime Minister. I've met so many people that maybe in my time I'd never have dreamt of. I've met presidents. I've received actually even Kenyan uh, heads. I've, I've, I've received the president, I've received most of the governors whenever they've come to UK. I've always been there to receive them. Uh, the embassy has always used me as a Kenyan British. So I believe despite the challenges, I, I'll talk of the, the better side of my being mayor. Absolutely. I've been exposed to so much. Okay. Go mother. I am. Okay, and there's this notion, especially in Kenyan mm. politics, that a woman cannot be in politics and manage a family. So how has it been oh, for rubbish. you balancing the two? That's rubbish. Mm -hmm. It depends. You have to be an individual. It's got it's nothing to do with your status. When I was a head teacher, I was still a single mother, and I did it to my best. And I also believe, sorry to say that, we have, I think I've got more time because I do not have so many other duties. So I can give much more of my time mm -hmm. as a single parent. I'm not advocating for that. But I, th that should not be taken as the case. It's, this depends on individuals. You've got to be an individual. And what, what you want as an individual, nothing to do with your status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see if we can take those calls now coming in for Elizabeth Kanyeve. We have uh, David from Eldoret. Good morning, David. Can you hear us? I was born to you. All right, David, what's your question for Elizabeth today? Okay, I, my, my question is simple. 
Uh, I admire the mayor from London. Uh-huh. Uh, I was suggesting, I was asking a question, is, is she considering standing for the Nairobi Subaterian post? Come again, David? Uh, I was asked whether she's ready for Nairobi go governor. In oh. 2017. Okay. Uh, he's asking whether you're ready for Nairobi governorship in 2017. Well, I did say time will tell. Mm -hmm. Time will tell. With politics, you really have to be careful what you are doing. I do not just want to come out and start saying I want to venture into A, B, C, D. Uh, I need to study. I need to really know what it takes. And then, uh, obviously, the people can decide. So it's still a bit too early to think about that at the moment. I know people have started, you know, giving themselves posts and all that. But uh, maybe time will tell what I'll do. All right, that's thank your you so answer. much. <laughs> thank you very much, David, from Eldoret. And let's move on with our interview. Other than supporting women um, from black and minority ethnic groups to settle in into the British society, what other community projects are you involved in? We do have youth projects. We do have youth empowerment projects, and actually we do that through the churches. Uh, we encourage our youth, especially when they, they, they move ab abroad, because some of them still do not have the, the, the self-esteem. They still have re very low self-esteem. We do encourage them, you know, to study, to go, to take into any, you know, any senior jobs, mm -hmm. because once they study and they're qualified, they, sh they, you know, you can go anywhere. So we do have that youth empowerment projects, which you know, have helped so many of our youth. And, uh, you know, so at the moment we find that we've got so many women, so many youth who are venturing into some of what we would have thought before was, uh, you know, un the unreachable. Mm -hmm. So I, I still do do that. And uh, also as a teacher, um, the education sector, I do think about that so much because my background as a teacher, I do work, we, 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 I, I've, be, I've been sitting in the groups that write some of the policies in education in, in UK which is such an advantage for me. Mm -hmm. So there's still so much that I still do in the community. Right. Now, having been in politics in the UK and still having a Kenyan background, how can you compare politics in the UK and politics in the country? One thing, politics in UK, when it comes like to campaigning and all that, is so ethical. Mm -hmm. You know, campaigning is campaigning, politics is politics. But we go to the ground, one, our campaign is totally different. We do not have open grounds where we go have microphones and shout. We go door to door mm -hmm. and we write down, uh, you, have, you have a leaflet where you introduce yourself and you talk about your policies. So it's very, very different. It's quite tedious because you've got to go door by door. Yeah, that's a lot of people. <laughs> yes, it takes a bit of time. So it starts, that's why I said when I became councillor in 2010, we had started two years before. So it's quite tedious. It's very, very different from what happens here. Uh, the other bit about the, the Kenyan politics, I find it a bit uh, rough, mm -hmm. uh, especially on the open ground where there's open insults, open, you know, you know it's, it's not very nice. Mm -hmm. Go to the people, tell the people what you have to offer. I don't think I should go and start op talking about you Your and rubbishing you. Yes. Leave me alone, let me go and campaign, go and campaign and let the people decide. And that is what happens in the UK, mm -hmm. you know. So I found that, you know, a bit different mm -hmm. because I find it a bit shoddy here where, you know, there's sometimes you listen to that and you feel, oh my God, that is not the right way. I'm doing my <coughs> campaigning by rubbishing you because you are my opponent. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't. Let me go and sell my policies. Let me go and sell myself. And then we leave the people to decide. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's kind of slightly different. All right. I understand we have another caller from Nairobi. Good morning. What's your question? Hello. Yes, good morning. Go ahead. Oh, okay. my name is Joe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a comment. What's your I question? Thinking, I was wondering when, uh, when women are elected, uh, do they realize they have an responsibility to say even men? Because they always talk about the women, the women like. Like here we have a problem with uh, about uh, men. They yeah, are genitalians being cut, but now you always talk about the women, this is happening to women. You know, there's nobody who's talking about men. Okay, <laughs> maybe you can address that, Elizabeth. The one that's to talk about men. Yes. I think men have been addressed. I mean, it, it's the reason why I'm not just talking about me, women because I'm a woman. 
yes, one, that's one good reason. But I think women have been left behind for so long. And uh, it should be a mixture. I believe this, the same way God created us, we should be taking a human beings, not just men or women when it comes to politics or when it comes to leadership. We're not leaving men out. I, I work with men. I, I campaign against men. But the reason why I talk about women specifically is because we, we feel that we've been left out for a long time and it should be a time, our time also to come out and venture if we are able to, if we have got what it takes. So we are not leaving the men alone. We are not leaving the men out. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much. Let's move on. And now another comparison I want us to make is of the, let's say, relating to that question, actually, uh -huh. the, there's a lot of debate in Kenya regarding the implementation of the two-thirds gender rule. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Since the Jubilee administration came into power, it is yet to be implemented. What is the comparison between the participation of women in politics in Kenya and the UK? I think that you always be an issue. And uh, I, I, I was looking at, uh, when I looked at the manifesto, and I looked at since the Jubilee government, I think there's been a change. Mm -hmm. I've been, look at having CS Ambassador Amina, getting those senior posts. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately about the, the, the Anwai Guru and all that. I think we are getting there now. First of all, we start with a few. We do not want to jump the hoop and just make, you know, get so many women there. I think we are getting there. I've seen, you know, the women rep, although I'm yet to see some of them, their roles and all that. Uh, but I, I believe now we're kind of getting there. Mm -hmm. We're not yet there, but we're getting there. But it's also up to the women to come out and present themselves. And then the people will decide. Mm -hmm. And also when they are elected, I think the women also should compete equally with the men. Mm -hmm. Not really competing, but they should deliver. You know, so that you retain and so that the people can really have the, the confidence in you. Once you're elected in whichever post, deliver and deliver effectively. Okay. So I believe you're getting there. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, let's take another caller, Mohamed Hussein from Isiolo. Good morning. What's your question? Morning, madam. How are you? Very well, thank you, Mohamed. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, first, I wanted to construct, uh, congratulate uh, madam thank you. For, for having um, a hand in, in Europe in, in Britain politics. Thank you. The second thing I wanted to ask her, is that uh, she's doing a very good thing about the youth empowerment and the rest. As a politician who has stayed in, in Britain, I would ask her or request her to ensure that uh, there is an exchange program between Kenya, especially the youth from Kenya, especially in arid areas like Isiolo and you are, you, where you are in Britain. Then the other point I wanted to tell you is that when you have come to Kenya, not only staying in maybe Nairobi, we want you to come <laughs> down like to the counties and tell the people how you are elected so that it's going to impact on how we do our politics. Where you are elected, not necessarily you had the numbers, you are not a white lady, but you are elected on your policies and the rest. I think this is going to change the way we are doing our politics and what is important is that at the end of the day you said are your policies <laughs> not your tribe not your religion but the urge and, and passion for serving the people in a nutshell what i want to ask you is that please especially in an area like where people have been marginalized for a very long time ensure that you've uh, partnered with the local leadership or uh, the local government <coughs> so that you are able to cure for us issues like scholarships so that in future we are not seen as a people who fight the, the maybe we fight because we've got a lot of resources but because an idle mind is a devil's workshop people are not able to engage and we've been considered to be marginalized yet we've got a lot of potential and a lot of resources which have not been harnessed. And once these are harnessed, we are able to compete with the others and issues like poverty and famine are going to be uh, history to us. Thank you very much. All right, yeah. Thank you very much, you. Mohammed. Well, invite me. <laughs> invite me. And uh, I'm ready, I'm willing to go out whenever I'm invited. Actually, even this time, we had uh, spoken with the governor of Bomet. He wanted me to go and uh, 
have a few talks, but I can't say that come for my brother's funeral. But if I'm invited and uh, if I'm not very busy, definitely I would be willing. I did say I'm ready to give back to my community. Mm -hmm. And if the little, if I can meet, change one person, glory be to God. I would love to do that. So just invite me. Uh, I'll be willing. I'm ready to give back. And I've also invited and given uh, some of our leaders a forum where they have come and learned. Recently, I had a group from Kiambu. I've had several governors. I've hosted the governor of Meru, the governor of Kericho, the governor <coughs> of Meru, uh, um, Bomet, a few Kisumu. They've come and they've had a few talks, you know, a taste of what we do. So if, uh, like I said, if I can give back, I am willing. I just need to get that invite. I, can, I cannot just walk into Ajia or Garissa or Mandela or, you know, Moyare and start talking to people. But if, given the right forum, if, if I'm invited, I'm always ready. If I can help somebody, if I can inspire anybody, if I can help change anybody, I am willing to do that. Just send the invite and then I can look at the program. I've actually been, uh, I went to U.S. Uh, last month three times. I was invited by women groups, uh, different groups of Kenyan communities, just to talk to them about how I manage. And that's how I managed to be in this magazine that I'm holding here, where they, you know, they wanted to learn how I did it. And because they are in the diaspora also, so that they can also be inspired. But I believe I should give back more to my country where I belong. So thank you so much for that encouragement. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed. I hope you got your answer. Uh, let's move on, Elizabeth, uh, with more questions about yourself. <laughs> so on. as a Kenyan or a foreigner, you know, basically, what is required of you to be part of politics in the UK? What is the protocol, the process? One thing in UK, uh, once you've been there for about five years, you can always apply for citizenship. Mm -hmm. And that is what people do. So once you're a citizen, and you have no criminal records, you mm -hmm. can go ahead and join anything, do anything. Mm -hmm. So that's all you right. need to do. And do we have academic qualifications? Yes, for you we also to look at that. Office. We also look at that. Mm -hmm. Though they also train you on the job. I've done uh, leadership uh, degrees while I'm still in, in, in politics. Although, <coughs> obviously, you cannot just come from the bush and start venturing mm -hmm. so that the academic qualifications are also very, very important. Right, mm -hmm. right. So were there any, you, you were a teacher yes, before, I was. you know, yes, I was. you were a teacher. And so venturing into that, and I actually wanted you to tell us um, the process <laughs> through the, uh, from teaching, because I understand that you were part of a teacher's union. Yes, and that's how you ventured into politics. So tell us a bit about that particular transition. Well, obviously I was trained as a teacher here, but uh, going abroad, my qualifications were not good enough so mm -hmm. i had to go back to teaching i had to go and train as a teacher take mm -hmm. get a, a so teaching degree fresh. not i wouldn't say it's a fresh because my points counted having been a head teacher i just got a recommendation from the teacher service commission to confirm that i was a head teacher mm -hmm. and that was confirmed from kenya and so when i went back to uni it didn't take me the, the four five years and i did more of on the job so that was an advantage but our qualifications are, it, it's a kind of a conversion but mine, because I was primarily trained, I had to kind of go for two, three years so that it was more like a refresher. So, and uh, teaching, the Kenyan system of education is not very, very different from the British system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Kenyans, obviously, most of us, like in my school, I went to an secondary school, most of my teachers were British. Mm -hmm. So we, we, it, it is not a big transition for us. So, uh, and uh, when I started teaching, I became the union rep of the black uh, and head black women and head teachers union. Mm -hmm. So I've always been a head a, a representative there. Okay. And when you are a rep, they take you to so many seminars. And through that, you kind of learn more of the leadership. Mm -hmm. So, and I said, I also did a leadership course where I, I became a, before I became a counselor. And when I became a counselor, also they take you on so many leadership seminars, how to chair meetings, you know, how to uh, deliver speeches. So there's so much that you learn. Right. Now, having taught in both countries, we ran a story earlier on on how the quality of public education in Kenya mm -hmm. is lower than countries who even have a lower GDP per capita as compared to Kenya. So what would be your comparison of the quality of education in the UK and in Kenya? I wouldn't say that the quality of education in Kenya is low at all. Mm -hmm. Because now I'm talking through experience. I said I taught here for almost 20 years in Kenya. And now my teaching experience in, in UK, almost 13 years. And having been a head, here, head teacher here, which and I had to go deeper into the curriculum. And now in UK, I sit in the committee, which is called the Children's Services, and uh, we look at the curriculum, writing, changing. 
our, it's, I think the only difference is the delivery. I think um, we are good. Our system is good. But the only bit that may be the difference is the overburdening of our children. Mm -hmm. Because what in, in the UK, what the system does is that once uh, the, 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 the teachers realize that a certain child has a certain talent, they try now to bring up that child in that line of where they think of oh, this child. According to their strength. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think, but while we're in Kenya, a child might not be I, I, the best in academia, but we still push them. A child might not be the best in maybe in geography, but we still push them. You they have, have to, to do, do the it, exams yes. in that. So that makes a lot of difference. You know, okay. that's the main difference. But our system is not that bad. It's, it's good. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for speaking to Elizabeth Kanyede, the first black female mayor of Bucking and Dagenham in the UK. Thank you very much for joining us on Weekend Express. That brings us to the end of the program. My name is Michelle